Good afternoon, everybody. Hello, and welcome to another episode of Pull Back the Curtain. My name is Rob Bolden. I am the Artistic Administrator for Pittsburgh Opera, and it is a pleasure to be with you once again for another episode of um, our in-house web series, if you will, that we've been doing. We are now at episode nine. We've had some great guests, had some great information over the past couple of weeks, and uh, it's been a lot of fun connecting with all of you during this time. Today is no different. We've got a great guest lined up. We will get to him in just a minute. But um, before we do, uh, a special thank you to all of you who tuned in this past week for the resident artist welcome party. Hopefully you had a chance to get to know some of our resident artists hosted by Christopher Hahn and Bill Powers, an engaging look into the new class for this coming season and all that they uh, have in store as they are kind of our in-house casting for the whole season. This Sunday, and we will get to this as part of this interview, this Sunday is Rising Stars. Those of you who have attended in the past know that this is essentially the first time that we get to uh, hear from our resident artists vocally. We get to see them perform, we get to hear them perform. It's a great opportunity to sort of vocally meet the resident artists. This year, however, we are doing it virtually, as so many events are. So you can tune in this Sunday evening. Check our website, pittsburghopera.org, for more details on that. Please register. There will be voting. There's going to be comments. You can certainly tune in. It's going to be a great opportunity to meet these young, wonderful singers, as well as a special um, interview with the resident artist stage director as well. So. Without further ado, getting into to today's episode, I am uh, very excited to welcome today's guest, our head of music, Glenn Lewis. He has been with the company for 14 seasons, I believe. He can correct me if I'm wrong. And head of music for 12. Uh, it's, it's, it's a great tenure. Um, he and his colleagues are all long-standing members of the music staff. And so it's a real pleasure to get to chat with him. As I bring him in here today, though, Please feel free if you are tuning in to uh, ask questions. We will try and get to some of those today. Um, we've got some things that I want to talk about, but if you have burning questions for our head of music, please feel free to uh, shoot those in our comments and we will get those to Glenn. So without further ado, we will bring him into this stream. Maestro Lewis, welcome. Can you hear me? I can. Good afternoon. Yeah. Fantastic. I always check. That's my first thing I do at the top of every show, just as uh, we're all navigating this technology. It is lovely to see you um, as sort of in person. And, and the irony here is that uh, I shoot this show from uh, currently from uh, Maestro Anthony Walker, our music director's uh, studio. So the piano behind me, obviously you can kind of see touches. But Glenn, you're not far from me. Tell us where you are at the moment. Well, you know, after after six months of being away, I am thrilled to be back in the George Roland White studio of the Pittsburgh Opera Building in the Strip District on Liberty Avenue. I'm at the other end of this city block long building from you. <laughs> and just this week, so last week I talked a little bit about uh, the resident artists being back and we started, uh, they'd been quarantining and all of that. This week we started some live in-person coachings. Glenn, tell me what that felt like after such a long hiatus from that kind of work. Oh, it's it's more than anything. It's just exciting to be back doing it. Um, we we eased into it, of course. We did. We started uh, with a week of uh, virtual online over uh, coachings over Zoom or Skype or FaceTime or WhatsApp uh, before this. So we've been working with them for a good week, and and none of us knew how that would go. Uh, to have we with slight delays, we can't we can't accompany from one side of it while they're singing or anything like that. But it was an opportunity to do a lot of good musical work and a lot of work on the recitatives. But now to come back into the building finally, because there's nothing like singing in a great big room and feeling like you can really just let everything out. And uh, although we're taking an, uh, extraordinary precautions, safety precautions, and health. Uh, and safety precautions in the building. Um, it's just great to be back um, singing and working on languages and working on musicality and roles. Um, even if they're 15 feet away from me in the room and there's a big uh, 
there's a plastic shield that you can't see it obviously because it's transparent but it's right behind me and so there's a, a plastic shield uh and we are we're working uh, very carefully with that, including everybody, when people come into the building, there's the various safety precautions and, and including everybody has their own music stand with their name on it. So they only touch their own music stand and carry it around. And then we're assigned to specific instruments. There's my two colleagues, James Lesniak and Mark Trofka. We're fortunate to have three large spaces that are far enough apart that we can actually do our work pretty normally uh, with, you know, and, and there's really almost no risk at all involved. And there's careful, we can only go up certain staircases and down other staircases and go through the garage if you have to. Don't go through the wardrobe room at all. Uh, <laughs> and so everybody's kind of getting used to uh, these protocols, but everybody's really been cooperating from the get go and everyone's excited to be back and uh, singing in, 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 a, in extraordinary circumstances. It, it, it's, a little, it's a little surreal to be in the building, having come in for this show all, all summer, and now to be in the building and hear music being made. I think uh, that's kind of it's very uh, it, it's it's very wonderful and and also very odd, which is unfortunate. But those are the t these are the times we're in, and um, that's kind of what we're all dealing with. Glenn, before we leave the topic of where you are. So the studio that you're in is actually where we're going to perform um, our entire season. And That's right. uh, I'd love to hear from you a little bit about the season and, and maybe a show or two that you are excited about. And in some cases you are, you will be playing in, correct? Mm -hmm. Yes. Absolutely. Uh, well, of course we're starting with um, a, a 90 minute version of Mozart's Così Fan Tutte and with some very clever, um, very clever cutting and and rescoring, uh, we're going to present a 90-minute version of Cosi Fan Tutte. Some people say, "Oh, that's sacrilege, cutting Mozart," but actually, I think people are going to find it very engaging, and this production is going to move along very quickly. It'll be very simply staged, uh, obviously, and we're going to be taking all safety protocols. It will probably be as much uh, concertant as any, you know, because you have to be careful. It's an opera about lovers, so love duets are tricky. Mm -hmm. um, but our physical situation will be, there'll be a small number of audience members, very carefully uh, spaced, and then the, the action will take place on the main part of the floor. And then those of you who've been to the to the opera building, the, the George Roland White studio, there's a great big folding wall and the wall will open, that wall will be opened up entirely. And the orchestra, the, the, the 17 piece orchestra that we're gonna use will be spaced behind the singers. And then we'll have monitors placed such that they'll have contact with Maestro Anthony Walker. Uh, and the orchestra will be, uh, it's about 17 players, which actually um, is working very well. We've been spending a lot of time making this reduction work because then we can, you know, it's a fortunate thing. We have a former industrial fa factory, so that gives us a lot of space. So we can do this pretty, we can do this safely, we think. Uh, and then, so my, then my role in this, uh, I have several. Um, first, uh, for performances, I'll be playing what's called the continuo for the recitatives. That's the, those are the parts of the opera in between the set numbers. And it's where a, a lot of the, 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 the dialogue and the action goes. It comes, the term recitative comes from the, the Italian word recitare, which is to act or to play uh, on a stage. And so they are, um, that's where more of the dramatic action takes place because it's often the arias are kind of reflected. They're talking about emotional reflections or feelings or something like that. Um, Mozart tends to have the plot move forward in ensemble numbers. Mm -hmm. um, but then, so what I'm doing is as part of that, I am accompanying them what will be on an upright piano. Now, sometimes it's done with a harpsichord. Sometimes it's done with a forte piano. Um, for these circumstances, what we, we use an upright piano in part because it's easier to hear, and if played very lightly, it sounds like a forte piano. And the role of the continuo, I, I set up set up the harmonic progression, and I help with the the pacing of the recitative. Sometimes, if if a character comes in with a big flourish or something, I'll play a big flourish on the the, the piano, or if it's sort of careful or con or very quiet you might just play a few notes a few just a, a very quiet chord or nothing at all if it's something that comes out of the previous number 
and um, actually is better if simply the character picks it up from the end of the number and we move on and then I will punctuate things or there's a, a phrase there and it needs a, a strong chord to, to punctuate a particular thought, something like that. So Glenn, let me ask you a question. So, I mean, uh, as we're getting a little bit more into the weeds on this, but uh, before we leave this, um, so the continuo really is uh, like another character so commentary. You ever play? Uh, you ever play a chord when it's supposed to be major? You come in with minor and throw the whole thing off. Uh, no, I don't do that. <laughs> well, one, I'll give you an example. I'll give you an example. Of one thing I do like to do. Sometimes you like to do a like a quotation, and and if we've done Don Giovanni in the past, and there are several scenes in Don Giovanni where, of course, what's he doing? He's trying to seduce a woman, and I've always tried to. Anytime that happens, I try to work in a little quote from his serenade from the second act to say every time, oh, he's at it again. And yeah, here's a yeah. just to remind you, and then of course we finally get to hear the serenade in the second act. So if there's ways to incorporate quotations from, from the opera, mel melodic, you know, uh, thematic material, that helps to punctuate. And it's, it's sometimes it's subtle, some people pick it up, then other people, oh, I get that later. Yeah, I don't wanna put you on the spot, but aren't you sitting at a piano right now? I am sitting at a seven-foot grand piano right now. You want to give us just like a, a, a like a, a little noodle of what what you might do to punctuate a character's entrance. Something like that. Beautiful, and then they come in and they go on with their 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 talk, their dialogue, and right. off we go into the scene. Uh -huh. um, so, Glenn, I, I'd love to talk a little bit more. I mean, the season is great, but you know, you've been here for many years, which is which is kind of wonderful. Um, uh, music staff for fourteen, head of music for twelve, but you don't do it alone, right? We've got no. we've got a terrific music staff. So, I'd love to hear a little bit from you about how the interplay with your colleagues, uh, the wonderful Mark Trautka and fantastic James Lesniak, make up for the viewers at home. Make up our music staff. How do you complement each other, and and what is your role? How do you fit into that trio? And then, you know, how do you complement each other over the course of the season? Mm -hmm. Well, of course, I, I would say first of all that we're a quartet because we certainly want to conclude our my, our longtime maestro Anthony Walker is, is the head of what we do. Um, we we each we we complement each other in that we we have different strengths and different things that we are uh, more more that that we feel are our our contribution. And I give a thing. Mark, for example, is very very. Uh, tuned into uh, vocal technique, and he helps people very much so with the with the actual instrument. I feel like I spend a lot of time helping uh, singers become better musicians, challenging them on you know because anytime we do for like a, a contemporary score and the harmony is extremely complicated, um, I spend a lot of time helping uh, particularly with the the musical concepts. Um, uh, Mark is very strong with uh, the Slavic languages. He can work with the Russian or the Czech. I lived in Germany for 11 years, so I have, uh, I spoke, I speak German very well, and I bring that. And we, we've all studied Italian. And James is very strong with uh, the French language as well. Uh, and then, um, because Mark is the chorus master, mm -hmm. and I'm the I'm the company's chief uh, rehearsal pianist. Mm -hmm. uh, which means I, my, one of my roles is that I have to be ready at the first day of music rehearsal for whatever we're doing to play the score for the maestro with the singers and be ready and prepared as if it were the piano dress rehearsal. That the score has to be prepared and ready to be played. And then sometimes I'll go over if Mark, if Mark needs a, 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 if James is not available for some reason, I'll come over and I'll play a chorus rehearsal or, um, uh, you know, James will play for me because I've conducted several works in the company. Because I, I, uh, I have, I've been conductor, I've been principal rehearsal pianist, vocal coach, co-librarian, uh, <laughs> New Year's Eve conductor, and and part of what I is is that I straddle the the vocal and and sort of staging rehearsal world of the opera company, but I spend a lot of time with the orchestra. Mm -hmm. Spend a lot of time with orchestra parts, preparing orchestra, working with the orchestra players, or playing in the orchestra, whether it's playing continuo for something like Cosi Fantutte 
or um, when we've done something like our world premiere a couple of years ago, the Summer King, I played piano in the pit for that. So I, I've, I've worn a number of hats in my uh, time here and that, that uh, pleases me a lot. When you get here, you're, you're, you're primarily uh, primary, uh, rehearsal piano. When you shift gears and you're on the podium, how does that mindset change for you? How does that, what does that do in terms of your mindset in terms of either preparation or then communication once you're in the rehearsal room? Uh, I'm sorry, I didn't hear the first part of the question. There was a, a little bit of a technical ah. uh, glitch there. If you could repeat that. I'm, I'm curious how your mindset changes between when you between being rehearsal pianist and being on the podium. How do you prepare? What do you bring to the room that's a little bit different in each of those roles? Because you toggle, and in your case, you have been on the podium for some um, for some for a lot of contemporary works as of late. The Last American Hammer, uh, The Long Walk. So those, I would assume, get prepared differently than a Mozart piece or mm -hmm. Donatelli or any of the classic canon. So I'd love to hear a little bit about that and the change of the difference in role between being at the keyboard during rehearsal and being on the podium. Um, I think one of the main the main things is when when you're when you're the conductor, you're leading this. Mm -hmm. You are leading this. Whereas when you're the, the chief pianist, you you have to be ready to go with the conductor. You have to be ready to you're you're, you're part of a, you, of course you're part of a triangle. There's a singer, there's a pianist, and there's a conductor, and you're trying to tune in and support the conductor. At the same time, listening to the singer because if the, if the triangle's working properly, there's a lot of give and take. Mm -hmm. And then the same thing is is I'm going to bring if I'm if I'm the conductor, I'm going to bring. My, I mean, I always bring everybody brings their ideas to the table, but I, I, I want to have to have a, a, a broad overview of the piece. I have to have studied the, the orchestra score intimately and pretty much be able to to sing all of the parts, at least in a sort of croaking vo uh, vocal coach kind of voice. And um, you, you have to when you're on the podium, you have to convey a sense of calm. Mm -hmm. And then everything's going to work out. Everything's going to be fine. And you, you know, you got to have a very, particularly with these contemporary pieces, you got to have a very clear straight ahead beat and, and, you know, be ready to cue all the time. All there's, 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 there's no, there, there's no autopilot at all in something like that. Yeah. And, uh, as opposed to a piece of the Mozart pieces, there's, there's 200 years of common knowledge of the piece. True. And people can draw on that, um, not to make it just like it's always been, obviously, but there's common knowledge in that, whereas the new pieces, there might be a half a dozen people in the entire world who know the roles. Right. Do you ever, when you step on the podium, do you, do you ever get nervous and you've got to just bring that down, take a breath and stay the course? How does that factor in? That yeah. Oh, yeah. Yes. Absolutely, and and be and be ready. There's always the possibility that somebody's going to get off, mm. and make, the, and the decision you make is how can you fix it the most effectively. Sure. Is, it, is it simply do you give a hand to a singer like this, wait and then go? That's a possibility. Did somebody jump the gun in the orchestra? Uh, in one performance, I had to I had not loudly, but I had to give three measure numbers in a row to get one of my players back on track. Uh, just, you know, hopefully nobody heard it, but uh, things like that happen. And, I, and from 30, 35 years in the business in, oh, in this country and in Germany, it's live. This yeah. is live yeah. and yeah. stuff can happen. And, you know, we do things here when we're in the GRW and we draw American hammer or things like that. People are sometimes the conduct I'm in, I'm, not in front of them, I'm behind them or on the side and they're looking at a monitor. So I'm listening and I'm looking at a monitor, uh, the beat is going into a monitor. Well, where, you're, uh, also, you're also only 20 feet from the audience. So we can see and hear everything you do. It's, it, it, it's fascinating. I mean, there's so many facets to the things that we do behind the scenes and so many moving parts, but I think um, that's the beauty of having our wonderful quartet of music mm -hmm. staff because the, the talent level is so great that the fluidity with which you work together is, is wonderful to watch. And if our resident artists, as they come in, um, 
you watch them grow and you know that they've spent time with, you know, really four exceptional musicians, uh, yourself and your colleagues, and they come out, you know, better artists on the other end. Um, I did have a question or uh, a question came in uh, and I have been asked to ask you about your onstage Banda experience in uh, Daughter, in La Fille du Régiment. Um, and uh, so <laughs> I, I, I don't know the reference there, but I'm assuming, is there a story or is it just about being on the onstage Banda? Well, remembering, first of all, that the Daughter of the Regiment was one of our high point productions in the last few years where Lisette Oropesa and Larry Brownlee just brought the house down. Two and it's a hard. brilliant production by director choreographer Sean Curran. Mm -hmm. And there is a scene in the, in the second act where uh, not only does the Marquesa play the piano for this voice lesson scene for with Marie, but I'm, I'm at a, I, I come as, I, I was uh, the hired pianist for a, 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 a party later in the, a sort of a coming out, a debutante ball for Marie, which goes completely awry. But I, um, I had the pleasure of accompanying Anna Singer, of course, from our, our, our beloved announcer from WQED, who's such a wonderful uh, Pittsburgh Opera Symphony and Ballet supporter. Mm -hmm. And she came on and she sang, um, the Noel Coward song, Don't Put Your Daughter on the Stage, Mrs. Worthington. Uh -huh. And so I, I ended up uh, playing that. And I also had to, I think I had to play for some ballet music that was on that as well. Indeed, so, and you were on stage Bonda, so that was before my time, but you were also on stage Bonda for Elixir, Le Miseria d'Amore. Yes, there was. There's a scene in, in, in the cafe there in the second act where there's a trumpet and, and a tuba that was on stage. And we were simply part of this whole scene with Dulca Mara. Mm -hmm. um, these things are always, um, they're, they're, they're fun to do um, when they're not, when they're not hair raising. Right. Um, because well, so many, you know, these are, that, those are relatively simple because it's just me playing for somebody on stage, as opposed to something like, if somebody wanted to see chaos, they should see the backstage of Aida during the triumphal march. <laughs> where there are, there's not only the full brass section and orchestra in the pit, there are four trumpet players with long trumpets on stage up on the, on the upper level, and then a whole banda behind that, and we're coordinating with Anthony from the screen, and we have to be slightly ahead of him for it to arrive in the, in the audience at the right time. Right. That, or, or the, the banda for Turandot. The, this huge banda, which we had a couple of seasons back, right? Um, again, coordination and it's that that's that's hair raising stuff. That's exciting. Indeed, there's no limit. There's no limit to the talent of a great music staff. I will say that publicly. Um, no matter where you go, the music staff, uh, whether they're on the stage playing the piano, backstage on the podium, you name it, and we have one of the best. Um, I'd like to say, if I could, Rob, also just that um, another example, um, my colleague, James Lesniak, who came when he first came here, he was sort of sort of a, a junior coach. But over the, the years, he's completely, you know, he's completely, you know, same level colleague. Now he's made a conducting debut with us. Yeah. And uh, there's just growth. He's played, you know, so many different scores and is an ex excellent coach in his own right. There's no there, we're, we're as much linear as we are hierarchical. Indeed. I think that's what's so great about it. You, as I was saying, our resident artists can come in, even our principal artists, and if they want to coach, they're in good hands with anybody that they work with. And that is so nice to know. Yet at the same time, you all have different strengths. And I think that that's really important, too. It's a very complementary system um, to, to watch and watch it kind of unfold. Um, before we let you go and, and get on with your day, um, are there any other, uh, the, the productions for the remainder of the season, uh, David T. Little's Soldier Songs, followed by Handel Semele, and then rounding it out with Charlie Parker's Yardbird. Any thoughts on any of those? Will we see you in the in the pit for any of those as well? Um, but, but again, I think we talked a little bit, you mentioned that there is that sharing of responsibility for pit duty. Tell me a little bit about that. Well, exactly. And even in this, even in this more modest form of a season that we're presenting, we are we are playing to our strengths. In that, uh, we've done a number of successful Handel operas in the past, 
uh, particularly with our resident artists. And we've done a lot of contemporary operas, a lot of operas where the ink was barely dry uh, <laughs> when we started working on them. And uh, I, I'm looking very much uh, very forward to the Soldier Song. It's a solo piece for baritone for mm -hmm. Yasi Gray is going to sing it. And of course, we've done a number of pieces uh, recently that have uh, themes about about wars and experience of military people. We the, the long walk uh, was very, very vividly about that. And even tangentially something, I think a little bit, The Last American Hammer tuned into that a little bit as well. Glory Denied. Glory Denied, very much so. Yes, that was that was the other thing I was trying to think of just this minute. Um, that we these kinds of contemporary pieces that are right up close and in your face because they're so I mean, literally they're physically so close to you where we present them and then uh of course we a handle we've done a number of handle operas over the last 10 years and featured some of our wonderful resident artists in intimate settings and this all of this is that we are doing these in more intimate settings which is uh, a really wonderful thing i mean the bennett we love the bennett center but man it's huge Mm -hmm. <laughs> there are some some things that we can just bring across better in a in a uh, in a more intimate setting. So uh, you're asking about the keyboards. Um, right now, it looks like uh, James is probably going to play keyboards for uh, Soldier Songs. James Mark will be playing the continuo uh, for Semele, and of course, we will be inviting Chad and Baroque mm -hmm. will be with us for that as well. Our wonderful colleagues from there, and then I will. Pro I it looks like I will be playing for. Uh, 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 for word, Mark will be conducting uh, uh, soldier songs, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and then Anthony will be conducting the other two pieces. Of course, the the thing that one of the if I have a disappointment is that this year, had we done our regular season, I would be making my main stage debut conducting the Magic Flute. Well, so, we will we will pull indeed, and it is a disappointment, but we will we will look forward to that because that's not going away entirely. Right, right. It's, it will come. Indeed. Indeed. Well, I think it's it, it's such a nice chance to visit with you, Glenn, talk about the music, talk about the intricacies and, and um, both your roles as well as how those fit in with your colleagues. Because again, as you just illuminated, um, this season alone, uh, different pianists in the pit as part of the orchestra, um, Mark on the podium, you've been on the podium, James has been on the podium. Um, and so it's, it's, it's really great all working in coordination with Maestro Walker season, you know, every season that we have. So um, we're looking forward to it. I can't wait to actually start rehearsals as I'm sure you can't, but uh, thank you for taking a little bit of time today to just chat with us. It's always nice to see you, so to speak, even though we are maybe a hundred yards away from each other. <laughs> um, you know, I would only say just very finally is that yeah. it, it, all of these efforts that we've done, part of why this team works as well as it does is we have the support of Anthony Walker. He's always been supportive of all of these endeavors and sometimes taking risks, people going into something that's new for them. Uh, Christopher has always been, Christopher Hahn has always been, Bill Powers, they've always been very much on our side in yeah. trying to, it, all of these endeavors. Indeed, well, it takes, it takes a village and it takes a ton of support. And so, um, but you know, you don't take a risk like that if you don't think it's uh, gonna pan out. So it's, right. it's, a, it's an easy leap, you know, knowing the talent that we have. So Glenn, thank you so much for spending a little bit of time with me this afternoon. And um, for all of you who tuned in, thanks for tuning in and hopefully it was illuminating in some ways. Uh, but um, so uh, I am going to uh, bid adieu to Maestro Lewis. Glenn, we will see you soon at some point in the coming uh, days and weeks. And I look forward to getting started with Marriage of Figaro. So have a good rest of your afternoon. Arrivederci. That basically wraps up another episode. Uh, it was a great pleasure chatting with uh, Glenn today and, and, and all his insights into what he does, both he and the music staff at large, sharing in the responsibilities, working with Maestro Anthony Walker. Um, it really is because of them that uh, so many of the artists that have come through here, specifically our resident artists, they make uh, these transitions. They come in, they work with our music staff, and they leave better artists at the other end of that. And we are very fortunate to have that quartet of gentlemen on our staff. Um, that about wraps things up today for another episode of Pull Back the Curtain. Thank you all so much for tuning in. Please join us again this Sunday evening. You can check... Um, Check our website, 
pittsburghopera.org. Um, and if you are so inclined and you want to donate to this season, we would be grateful. Please check out the one-click donation link. You can find that in the comments, or you can check out the scrolling uh, text below, pittsburghopera.org slash give now. We look forward to seeing you all soon. Until then, please be safe, and uh, we will see you in the theater, hopefully soon. Take care.